Hello, welcome to this session. My name is Jeroen Boomgaard. I'm a professor of art and public space at Gerard Rietveld Academy here in Amsterdam. And uh, this part of the program has been organized by ARIAS in collaboration with MIB, of course. And ARIAS is a research platform, a collaboration between the five knowledge institutions of Amsterdam. Um, and that is also why in this program you will have speakers that come from the University of Amsterdam, from the HVA, but also from Rietveld Academy, as myself. In this session, we will be talking about the languages of architecture, what we call the double life. More in particular, the gap between the language, on the one hand, the language of the plans and the design, and the language as it works out in and on public space, on the other hand how it works to the people that use the architecture. You will be listening to three speakers presenting to you three case studies, but also three different ways to approach and think about this gap. Through three new ways of listening to the secret language of architecture. First, Stan Mayor will go into the, um, the wide gap in the development of the Zuidas in Amsterdam between the loud noise of the development plans and the resulting monotonous discourse on the ground and, and the difference between those. After that, Pinar will be talking about the rhythms of daily life architecture creates and makes us follow how it influences our behavior. And last, Tim will talk about the mediatization of architecture. Using the new marked area in Amsterdam as an example, he will show how the media offensive of development was met by a media counter offensive from the people that live there and what resulted from it. But for first, Stan Mayor. He is a professor of coordination of urban issues at Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Stan, please. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, yes, welcome at uh, my contribution to this uh, fascinating conference. Um, the title of my presentation is uh, Studying Frames in Space and Organization in Amsterdam's Most Prominent Urban Development Project of the Modern Era. And this urban project is, as Jeroen already explained, uh, in Dutch, Zuidas, in English, South Axis which is a place uh, I will talk about more uh, soon. My argument of the talk of 20 minutes is that it's very important to look um, not only at the visible architecture in a place, but to look behind it, to look at the processes that create this architecture and follow the struggles, the ideologies, and critically assess them over time. I use the concept of frames uh, and I understand frames as a set of ideas, visions, and interpretations that guide action. And frames are never stable. Uh, they can also be contested, uh, discussed, debated. And I think it's very fascinating to see how these frames can also change over time. So therefore, I take a bit of a longitudinal perspective to introduce you the project of South Axis a bit more. This is the place um, on the south side of Amsterdam, um, built in the last uh, two decades. Um, for the people that are not familiar with Amsterdam, um, it's not a place you would normally connotate with this city. It's a very modern place. Uh, it's a business district with a lot of high-rise towers, at least for Amsterdam standards. Um, and it's a fascinating place that has been discussed a lot in the city um, and has not been appreciated so much in the, in the city. And let's look a little bit into the history, how this place came about um, to, uh, and then to analyze it more critically. 
So this is sort of a, a, a schematic map of Amsterdam um, in 1981, where you see a quite interesting pattern developing with the historic canal zone as the traditional city center, but also with around that uh, upcoming series of areas that were actually more vibrant in their development. This is a time where most of the inner city developments were quite stagnant. Uh, I, I guess Tim will talk about that later. Um, and a lot of energy from developers, plan makers, shifted slowly to the fringes of the city. And it had to do with the ring road uh, that was slowly completed, the highway around uh, the west, the south and the east side of the city. Um, and also the sort of vibrant development zone really at the south side of Amsterdam, more in the direction of Utrecht on the one hand and the airport Schiphol and The Hague on the other hand. And exactly where these two places meet, there was this relatively empty area on the south side of the city, which um, got the attention of a lot of developers and slowly also the municipality. So what kind of frames, uh, what kind of ideas um, were being created for this area? It was, and I will critically assess it, the frame that South Axis would develop into a new mixed-use urban center. Um, and let's see how this, how this frame that sort of directed collective action uh, came about. It was in a way a successful combination of local, national and international perspectives and a sort of a, a, a concept to guide public and private investments over several decades. So on the one hand, the international aspect. Uh, this is the story of globalization, of new markets, of the rapid growth of Schiphol International Airport, which is actually very close to the South Axis development uh, in both passengers and freight. Um, and this sort of idea also being stimulated by European integration, that competition between cities became more important and cities should create places to attract businesses. Um, and this was also um, uh, strengthened by this concept of sort of trans-European mobility, for example, with enthusiastic plans that were made from the 1980s onwards to create a high-speed real network, which would also stop at South Axis. On the other hand, less visible in, in the real space was of course all kinds of policies that the Netherlands um, implemented to become some sort of fiscal paradise for businesses. So these were all policies to create some sort of energy around this idea of international competition and reposition Amsterdam as, a, as an important business center. Also on the national level, you see uh, that there was a growing attention from the 1980s and 90s onwards to investing in the big cities in the western part of the Netherlands. The Amsterdam metropolitan region, also consisting of Utrecht, and also the area of Rotterdam and The Hague. And also within the Amsterdam metropolitan region, uh, a lot of plans were made to sort of coordinate the burgoing growth of the city because the times were changing here. Uh, the city was from the 1990s onwards, uh, again, attracting more inhabitants, more businesses, um, and specifically uh, the fringes of the city were very attractive for new business developments. While on the same, in the same time, the inner city uh, became much more uh, like a heritage site and preserved and developed uh, for tourism. So this South Axis plan was sort of the, the frames where the different ingredients from the different sides came together. Um, and the plan was to use this opportunity on the south side of Amsterdam near the station to create a new urban area with a combination of housing, offices, public spaces um, and new connections between the north and the south side. And it was very important uh, for the support within the city uh, that it would not only be a business location. 
Amsterdam, as you might know, is a very left-wing oriented uh, political uh, city. Um, so um, it was important that the plan would, would also have other ingredients to get support for this massive investment. And one of the plans was to sort of roll out the city center uh, over the south axis. Um, so to create a sort of a second fascinating, more 21st century city center um, next to the traditional 17th century inner city of the city. But as uh, Jeroen already said, if we look at the results nowadays, um, at best they are mixed, I would say. <laughs> and not mixed in a way of mixed urban area, but mixed in the appreciation. Um, at least you can say it's a success in the number of, of, of buildings that have been constructed. Um, but this whole promise of a lively urban area um, is, is not realized yet. And some wonder if it ever will be. Um, it's a quite exclusive area with a lot of office buildings, some residential buildings, but all in the higher segments of the market. It's also a place with a lot of individual buildings, sort of standalone architecture. So on the one end, you had this sort of pacifying frame that brought a lot of action together of recreate this mixed use urban area. Um, but on the other hand, um, we see the results nowadays. How can we explain this difference? I think, um, and this is really looking behind the architecture, we have to look at sort of unconnected and alternative frames that were actually in place, that were a bit hidden behind this frame of a new mixed-use urban area. On the one hand, you had the national government, who is an important player in the South Axis development, because it owns the, the central infrastructure um, that is in the area, which is the highway, the trains. For the national government, they had not so much um, connotation with this idea of mixed-use development. For them, South Axis is an infrastructure project. And this is one of the parts of the project that had seen some progress, but also have seen some struggles because of cost overruns. Um, but for the national government, the South Axis is just one or two kilometers in a, in a national infrastructure network. Um, and they have their own planning, their own organization, and their own ambitions. The local government, on the other hand, uh, was much more closer at heart to this idea of a mixed-use urban area. However, um, it also used the South Axis development to earn a lot of money. Uh, it was a greenfield site, so uh, there could be really a, a sort of a cash input when greenfield is transferred to high-rise office buildings. And this money was needed to pay for all kinds of contributions from the, from the local government, for example, to this infrastructure project, and not so much to other more social or urban goals for the project. And third, for the investors and the owners, it seems to me it's not so much a place for uh, urbanity or mixed use, but it seems to be more a place for some sort of ego buildings, buildings that create an interesting ensemble, but individually do not contribute to this idea of, of a mixed-use urban area. And particularly um, those office buildings like on the right bottom um, that are not accessible, that not communicate uh, with the ground floors, for example. They are very prominent. Also, the fences are coming up in South Texas, as you see. So this has all led to the fact, as I said in my introduction, that the project is not really loved in Amsterdam. It's criticized a lot. What is interesting is that the project has also changed over time. Um, and what I find fascinating is that there have been all kinds of attempts to sort of try to repair this image of a not so successful mixed use area. Here we, you see some impressions of it. I don't have the time to go into all the details of what has happened with the project in the last decade. But some things I can highlight, for example, the idea to create more mixed uses by adding student housing, for example. Um, 
which is um, interesting also because of the debate, do students sort of, what do students contribute to an area? Um, we see, particularly during the global financial crisis, we see attempts to use uh, empty spaces for, for example, urban gardening, and also create spaces for, for residents inside the South Axis or coming from outside to sort of more own the place. We see attempts for festivals um, and attempts to sort of make the public space more interesting, for example, by uh, places to sell food. Um, but the fascinating thing again is that it's mostly expensive food and it's mostly for a specific catering for a specific target group, uh, mostly the office workers there. And the, the left bottom picture is a bit of a mystifying picture, but this is from, uh, from a, a recent television broadcast of the local Amsterdam uh, AT5 channel. And this is about residents of the South Axis, because there are residents of the South Axis that uh, protest against the McDonald's coming there. Um, and this is for me a perfect example of the struggle of this frame, because on the one hand, uh, you can say um, a McDonald's if you like McDonald's or not, fits an urban area. Uh, and there's a, there's a big demand, you can say, for also other cheaper food options. But on the other hand, uh, residents are against it. Uh, also, some of the office uh, owners are against it because they say it does not fit the image of the South Axis as a neat uh, and sort of high-end urban district. So here you see, I think, that there has been a very specific interpretation of mixed use and urban at place um, that, um, that has difficulties coping with the real urban character of a, of, or, or the potential real urban character of a place, which in my opinion also consists of diversity in, 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 in uses, in places for people with different income groups. Um, and the way the South Axis is organized till now, these kind of, of efforts are, are very hard to establish. And also on the right bottom, you see a picture of, it's a sketch still till now, from a new public library at South Axis. And this is also something that is really missing at the moment. Sort of public institutions or maybe institutions of art and culture, because all the land uses till now have been uh, based on the principle of creating profit, uh, direct profit, and not so much creating spaces for alternatives. So this leads me to the conclusion that the future of South Axis is in a way still open, because the area is not finished yet. Um, but the signs are not all that positive, because all kinds of attempts to create a more mixed-use urban area are hampered by sort of underlying principles and underlying conflicting frames. So my conclusion is um, for researchers that uh, we always have to very critically assess these frames, these very positive frames uh, that are so omnipresent in architecture that try to sell developments um, and be critical about sort of the use of the terms. In my case, the terms urban or urbanity that sort of portray an, an image that is not being realized. We also have to take into account organizational and financial structures in understanding spaces and places. Um, in this short presentation, I did not have time to go into this depth in this case. But for example, we have to look deep into the financial structures behind those um, developments. Also myself, I used organizational ethnography to get deep into the project bureau that manages this project to understand what kind of processes are underway in this project that sort of hamper um, this, this implementation of a real urban frame. And also we have to follow places longer term and understand changes. It's always very simple as a researcher to step into a place uh, to make your assessment and to often criticize a place. But South Axis is a very long-term development. And I think <clears throat> on the one hand, we also have to, have to give it some, some time. There are changes and we have to understand changes and what makes changes possible or impossible. 
And finally, for practice, um, I think if we think about how architecture can contribute to interesting urban areas, if it is at South Texas or any other place, um, we have to get a language that is better in valuing conflicts in, air, in cities, um, because conflicts, um, particularly in this, these places like South Texas, are always in a way sort of suppressed. Conflicts are seen as, as uh, endangering the image of a place, for example, or endangering the unity of a place. Think of the McDonald's. But by make, we have to learn to make space for the unexpected, the deviant and the unplanned. And this is particularly very difficult under the conditions of, of the urbanization processes and the financial streams currently in play. And we have to understand that ultimately these kinds of value conflicts and conflicting frames create more resilient and ultimately more interesting areas than the neatly planned project type of development that South Axis has been till now. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Stan. Fascinating presentation. Great timing also. Very good. I have tons of questions, but I hope we can get back to that uh, after the next two presentations. Next, it's uh, Pina Shevkatli. She's an architect by training and now doing a PhD um, at the University of Amsterdam. Please, Pinar, go ahead. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, to contribute to, to, to contribute to this topic, I will talk about rhythms in cities as the notions that bridge uh, the physical and the social, um, the physical built environment and the social life there. Uh, by rhythms, I'm talking about rhythms in the social domain. Uh, so um, uh, people's activities, mundane things uh, that happen, uh, uh, or things we do daily, weekly. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, yearly, that eventually coming together characterize the urban places. And um, so I'm talking about rhythms in the social domain. And um, today I will discuss a case study uh, to give a specific example to the phenomenon of rhythms and uh, how we work with it uh, in the context of our research. Um, uh, to give you a bit of a context, I'm part of a, a research uh, project called D Designing Rhythms for Social Resilience, DRSR, um, in which we work uh, in between social sciences uh, and data science, um, where Karolin Neve, the chief science officer of Amsterdam, is the principal investigator. And uh, how we work is that we work in, the col in collaboration with the uh, city government of Amsterdam, uh, South Oost Borough. And uh, here we, um, as you can see in this timeline, we work based on case studies. So uh, we take questions from the city and uh, by doing so, we also develop more uh, the theory on rhythms. And uh, by also analyzing physical um, and social rhythms on one hand and data rhythms on the other, we aim to develop a new perspective to cities and social issues that take place there. And um, our first contact people in this research are uh, the local, neighbor, local level neighborhood professionals called Gebietsmakelaars uh, in Dutch. Uh, they're na or neighborhood connectors. And from then uh, we take, uh, the, uh, we decide on uh, the questions which are relevant for a sense of safety in the neighborhood. And uh, of course, uh, it's very important that, uh, so we decide on the questions together. We uh, always have uh, regular feedback moments during the analysis phase, and then uh, we always pay, uh, report back our findings. So um, in, in this uh, doing research with the city and for the city, these uh, three steps are uh, crucial, and we always try to include that in our work. Um, so the research context, as I said, is uh, Amsterdam South Oost, and of course we all know this famous picture uh, from it. It, uh, it offers a, a special architectural context as well. Uh, it was built in the end uh, of uh, the 60s uh, as a modernist house housing estate, the Balmermeer. And uh, after the completion, many changes uh, have taken place in this neighborhood. And uh, we can also see these uh, changes uh, as a way to suit the uh, physical, uh, this, the, this rigid physical structure that you see to the social life. And here, of course, there were big changes carried out, like demolishing of uh, the buildings, but also many things ta have taken place at the bottom-up level, like uh, citizens assigning new uh, usages to uh, certain spaces than in other ways that than the planners uh, might have envisioned, probably. 
But uh, this raises then the question of how to understand uh, the social phenomena that takes place in the cities and which results from the different types of uses in the urban area. Do we see them as, that as problematic or can we learn from it? And uh, today, as I said, I will talk about a case study, and this is about trash in outer spaces. And uh, in this research, we wanted to explore how the built environment, of course, with its social and physical rhythms, uh, influences the emergence of trash. Uh, so not to look at trash as an isolated problem, but how does it derive from the built environment? And again, uh, why it leads to a sense, low sense of safety in the, in the larger context of our research. Um, the research design um, uh, included uh, three main layers, I could say. One was uh, the work uh, with the cleaners. It, I, I had the uh, chance to engage with the cleaners and carry out participatory observations with them, for example. And of course, uh, we had sessions to bring back our findings. And also in this work with the uh, cleaners, we also um, had the chance to analyze a data set uh, uh, c collected from the reports of, of complaints about trash. It's called MORA. And then the second layer was uh, this thick ethnographic layer, of course, uh, which first started in the whole uh, city borough of Amsterdam, Saudos, then went into a specific neighborhood. But also here, I had the chance to engage with the residents there and uh, ask about their experiences of uh, rhythms and uh, trash, of course. And the last one was uh, this uh, important presentation or feedback moment layered, which I uh, ex mentioned be before, where we uh, brought our findings back to the neighborhood teams, but also to this uh, work uh, place uh, called uh, the Clean City, uh, which was also a nice context for the research to bridge our findings. So we had different moments of, uh, uh, of yeah, connecting our findings. Um, so, um, in exploring this issue, we looked at a specific neighborhood, and this was the Kaabjurt in Amsterdam, South, South, South Oost. And it's an interesting context because if you look at uh, this area from the bird's eye view, we see uh, two buildings uh, repeated, uh, Kickenstein on, uh, on your left and Kleiburg on your right. And of course, there's a third one in between uh, that is Kraftwerk, but uh, I'm not going to discuss uh, that so much. And uh, what is interesting here is that, um, so we have these uh, similar shapes and um, we see uh, some repetitive patterns around the buildings like grass fields or uh, driveways, bike paths, uh, parking spaces and um, sports fields. Um, however, these two buildings present contrasting trash performances, which took our attention in this case. Uh, so Kleiburg is known by the cleaners as the cleanest building in the whole city borough of Amsterdam, while Kickenstein as the most problematic from this perspective. Um, so, and uh, because it actually offers a lot of these repetitive um, spatial patterns around it, it also created, a, the neighborhood created a nice chance to understand what is happening there in terms of rhythms. And, um, Oh yeah, first I want to show this, sorry. And uh, if you look at it, oh yeah, sorry. And uh, if we look at uh, the buildings from more uh, in depth, uh, they received different transformations throughout the years. So uh, if you look at Kickenstein, it still displays the original Balmermere architecture. So uh, you have uh, this expressive plinth on the ground floor, floor level uh, with storage spaces. Uh, and uh, then on the top, uh, this uh, gallery, which, was, uh, which is the uh, common public space of the building. Um, while uh, Kleiburg, um, it received a massive renovation um, in uh, 2013, in which um, all the apartments were sold uh, for almost for free to residents who took the responsibility to refurbish them. So, and in these renovations, a big change that happened was again at this plinth level, where instead of uh, what you see in Kickenstein, the uh, um, uh, storage spaces and uh, gallery, it was replaced with private um, apart uh, ground floor apartments. Um, so, um, and because of this, it led to uh, the, the yeah, uh, public officials, city officials, I could say, um, to associate uh, trash with home ownership. So, Kleiburg, which is an, uh, how, a where people own their house, it's cleaner because of that, or Kickenstein, not because it's a social housing. So we wanted to go further from this definition. Um, so if you look at it from um, the reports perspective, so uh, as I said, we also analyzed uh, what happens there based on the complaints that are being registered. We get a complete different image from trash, actually, which was interesting for us to see. And um, there in Kleiburg, uh, there's a high dense concentration of complaints while in Kickenstein, not so much. So um, 
again, we wanted to see why is this happening as well? Is this also something that derives from uh, the rhythms of the environment? Um, so in the explorations into the rhythms, um, I uh, consider different, um, I, I start by identifying different uh, patterns in, in the cupboard. So first, uh, as an architect, I always look at uh, the spatial features. So it was a documentation and mapping of what types of spaces there are uh, in the neighborhood. For example, greenery, uh, pavements, where are they? And um, the playgrounds, all of these, I identified them as spatial features. And then the next was uh, to look at the social use. So what is happening at these spaces? What kind of activities can we observe? And how are they also assigned to certain spaces? And uh, of course, because the research was about trash, uh, I, uh, we also identified the cleaning types, uh, trash collection types, and cleaning frequencies, which was interesting in this case because they are also informed by these spatial and social use uh, patterns. For example, um, you clean an area based on uh, whether it's, it's a paved uh, road or it's a grass field, so you choose how to clean it. Or if it's a public space, it's cleaned uh, more frequent than uh, the residential areas. And uh, it was important in the analysis period, of course, when we're talking about rhythms, all of these different patterns, they come together uh, when we experience the outdoor spaces. So uh, we try to find a way to uh, actually engage them instead of uh, representing them as um, separate entities. Um, so, um, as I said, the coming together of these patterns, it was very crucial, and we identified that as a rhythm zones in the cupboard. In total, uh, it means that uh, each, there are five, let's say, emergent, emergent uh, patterns in the neighborhood, uh, which engage these uh, spatial features, uh, social use, and the cleaning patterns. And um, these are basically, as you can see in the different colors, uh, the transitionary rhythm zones that you find on the right side of uh, on the east, uh, eastern side of the buildings, the domestic rhythm zones on the western, and then uh, we have uh, the gathering rhythm zones, which are more the public spaces uh, around the buildings that are identified in green. Then uh, there are um, a commercial uh, zone, a rhythm zone, and then finally the inactive rhythm zones. So um, what was interesting to see is that, um, so uh, if you look at the map again, there is the, um, around the buildings, you see the same uh, types of rhythm zones. So on the Eastern side of the buildings, the transitionary and on the Western, um, the domestic. But what happens is that uh, they have different combinations in the buildings. So the domestic rhythm zone of uh, Kickenstein corresponds to an inactive, while that of Kleiburg to a gathering. So we asked ourselves if uh, this could be the reason that different experiences emerge in the neighborhood. So not only that uh, the, the spatial and social uh, engage, but also the uh, rhythms engage with each other. Um, so I will now deep dive deep into the rhythm zones to explain what I'm talking about, but maybe I start uh, with the transitionary one. Um, uh, so, uh, if we uh, look at these zones, we are here at the eastern side of the buildings. So here we have uh, sidewalks, uh, as you can see. In Kickenstein, of course, you see immediately that uh, these are not exactly the same kinds of spaces, they are slightly different. So in Kickenstein, there's a driveway next to the sidewalk, while in Kleiburg, uh, there, uh, we don't have that. And uh, on the other hand, in Kickenstein, there are the uh, storage spaces on the ground floor, and in Kleiburg, there are uh, the apartments, as I had mentioned below. Um, but what happens here mostly is that to these sidewalks, um, the main entrances of these two big buildings correspond. And also in Kleiburg, additionally, there are the entrances of the, um, of the ground floor apartments. Um, so, however, although there are these uh, spatial differences, when we look at it from the social perspective, so um, looking at uh, what, what, is, uh, what, what is done actually there, uh, they don't differ so much. Um, they both have, for example, um, people leaving their homes early in the morning and coming back home from work in the afternoon, because again, it's the outdoor circulation space of the buildings. Or uh, you can experience silences here throughout the day, so around lunchtime or so. Of course, you will see some um, uh, delivery pa uh, uh, package uh, deliveries or cleaners or these kinds of things. So uh, they had uh, similar rhythm patterns, uh, which enabled these to be analyzed as the same um, similar zones. 
but also um, uh, uh, from the trash perspective, it's interesting because they have the same cleaning patterns. They have the same kind of garbage collection and they're both cleaned uh, once a week. Oh, sorry, I had to go back to the domestic greenhouse. House. So uh, here uh, we are on the other side of the buildings. And um, it's, um, so, and which is interesting here is that uh, the other side is the most, uh, uh, more private side of the building. So uh, what, instead of having the, um, common corridors uh, on the above floors. Here we have private balconies of the residents. And uh, you see immediately uh, some of these details like umbrellas or clothes being hung or uh, tables being placed. So more personal items as well. And uh, again, like the previous rhythm zones, they're not the same, of course. Um, so on the, in Kyrgyzstan on the ground floor, there, is the, there are the storage spaces, while Kleiburg there are these uh, porches. Um, however, uh, from the, again, uh, the daily life perspective, they create sort of the uh, same sphere. So they both create a private privacy feeling, so you can't get too close to the buildings from here, uh, either at, your, uh, at, your, at Kickenstein or at Kleiburg. Uh, you hear children's voices uh, in the afternoon. You smell cooking uh, throughout the day. So uh, in that sense, uh, they also, at these areas, uh, present similarities. And also, again, from the trash collection perspective, uh, they, are, they, they display the same patterns of being cleaned once a week. Um, and then uh, we have these, uh, in between the buildings, uh, it's very typical to Balmermere architecture also, uh, you have these uh, large green spaces that uh, fill uh, the spaces in, uh, of the, between the buildings. Originally, they used to host a very thick uh, plant tissue um, that you can already see, all, still see in Kickenstein, um, but now they're more simplified for safety reasons. And uh, what happens here is that the reason that they're identified as inactive is because they don't show so much uh, difference throughout a daily setting in terms of activities. So um, you see occasional dog walking or people going from uh, A to B, but it, uh, it didn't show in my observations a very uh, um, specific rhythm. Of course, the weather is also important. So if it's nice weather uh, in Kickenstein, football tournaments are played and it becomes a very nice uh, space actually. And in Kleiburg, uh, you see uh, the residents kick picnicking around their buildings. And uh, then we have the uh, gathering rhythm zones. Um, so these are basically the common spaces in the buildings. And they have very different appearances. Uh, so for example, the Kickenstein parking space is identified here as a uh, gathering rhythm zone, as well as uh, the Krynes playground, for example. And the reason for that is because uh, they, hold, they are occupied throughout the day uh, with uh, people performing different usages of it. Uh, so for example, in Kickenstein, you will um, see uh, uh, people from close by eating there, for example, because it's very close to takeaway restaurants. And of course, this fence uh, creates a nice uh, chance for it, but also there are many uh, who prefer to sit uh, in, in the cars, for example. While in uh, Kleiburg, uh, the, 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 that parking space, it becomes a very uh, diverse social space throughout the day, first occupied by parents and then by um, uh, teenagers, teenagers, because it has all these like um, hiding spaces. And these spaces are cleaned every day because there are public spaces. However, they're both cleaned manually, uh, although you have some paved areas because it's easier um, to reach some spots by hand. And uh, the last one, uh, I, I'm checking the time also, is the commercial rhythm zones. And uh, here they're called commercial, hence uh, the shopping activities that they present. Uh, so uh, the, the rhythms of these zones are pretty much dependent on the opening hours of the shops. And before the opening hours, you see other things happening like uh, children going to school or people coming back to work, of course, because they're also close to public um, transport areas. But um, yeah, usually uh, they're very busy during the opening hours of the shops or the presence of the market. And these zones are cleaned uh, very well, uh, let's say, because they host the shopping activity every day and also with machinery. Um, so um, I mentioned before that um, we identified uh, the trash as a uh, as an e thing that emerges uh, uh, that emerges from the combinations of rhythms of the rhythm zones in the neighborhood. 
And um, so let's look at how that happens. I will give uh, two examples about it. Um, one is um, what happens at the domestic rhythm zones. So here, actually, we're on the western side of the building. It says <laughs> wrong there. Uh, but um, in Kickenstein, uh, we see that the domestic rhythm zones corresponds to an inactive. And uh, what this means is that um, the activities that take place are quite um, limited there. They become very silent areas because you have a very uh, private space corresponding to an inactive place uh, during, throughout the day. And this welcomes also unwanted activities like uh, residents throwing their, uh, the, the, sometimes the, the trash from their buildings or maybe it comes uh, harder to see when you drop something. Or um, yeah, uh, it, it doesn't uh, it, it doesn't become like a, a lively place at all. Um, while in Kleiburg, um, the the setting is um, a bit different because we have uh, the domestic rhythm zone uh, meeting uh, a gathering one, so it creates a very interesting uh, public and private uh, feeling actually, and uh, it's it's it creates a both uh, control from both sense uh, the so the public and the private. And uh, this is also interesting from uh, the cleaning perspective because uh, in Kyrgyzstan you have two zones which are cleaned once a day and uh, manually, so it's very hard to keep it clean there. While in Kleiburg you have one area which is cleaned every day and when it touches uh, another one, which is even though if it's not cleaned every day, the cleaners of course uh, can pick up the excess trash. So uh, this is one example. And uh, the other example is on the other side, so with the transitional rhythm zones, where uh, you see that uh, the uh, inactive rhythm zone in Kleiburg is more limited in size uh, than the Kickenstein one, while in Kickenstein you also have a gathering rhythm zone corresponding to a um, transitionary one. And this creates a much more complex uh, social setting actually throughout the day. So you have more passers-by, for example. You have more people who spend time uh, in the transitionary rhythm zones than uh, Kleiburg. So uh, there is a, a diverse uh, difference happening in, also in the rhythms eventually. And uh, the trash infrastructure doesn't really respond to this. And that also creates a problem uh, because there are the underground containers and they get immediately blocked if they get uh, these uh, food-related trash. Um, to conclude, um, I wanted to show with this presentation how we use rhythm as a way to understand the interaction between architecture and the social context. And uh, the rhythm zones uh, concept, of course, as I explained, it derives uh, from the relationship between the spatial features and the social use. Uh, they always uh, affect each other. They are always in uh, informing each other. However, at the same time, there's a different uh, dimension in which the rhythm zones uh, are in con uh, continuous contact. So there is this, uh, uh, we wanted to catch uh, with this concept, the fluidity of uh, social life in uh, in, in neighborhoods, um, yeah, and to better understand that. I will conclude like this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Binaya. Thank you for a great presentation. Thanks. And please join us at the table. Um, the last presentation will be by uh, Tim van Laan, Assistant Professor of Urban History at the uh, University of Amsterdam. Thank you, Jeroen, and thank you all for having me. Um, Balmer and the South Axis will both resurface in my presentation as well. Um, but I will be mainly discussing the mediatization of architecture in quite a literal sense. Mainly by delving into the role played by media in shaping and framing architectural discourse. Um, and in my talk I will explore the recent past. Um, but I will begin by talking about the near future which is very uncommon for historians, so please bear with me. Behind me, you see a rendering of Amsterdam's Bias district, which wraps itself around the tower block of a former, former prison complex. This, of course, is a rendering, a computer image drawn by a rendering firm. It is an image, I would say, that is completely detached from reality, from future reality. If you look closely, you'll see yellow lines uh, marking different lines um, in the street pavement and um, a separate sidewalk, which are actually quite foreign to Amsterdam. We don't see this kind of street pavement or sidewalks in Amsterdam, which leads me to believe that the rendering, rendering firm must have been based in the United States or one of the Commonwealth countries. 
And this image, I think, is the product of the globalization of architectural media and demonstrates how little property developers and architects um, care about local surroundings and communities today. This image um, could have been anywhere in the world. Now, the mediatization of architecture in our day and age, um, in particular in rendering, is problematic for more than one reason. This um, um, building, uh, designed by world-famous <coughs> firm MVRDV, is currently under construction close to Amsterdam South Axis. If we are to believe this computer-generated image, we can expect an inhabitable mountain cliff covered in greenery. I invite you all to travel to the current building site and see what has become of the rendering, especially on a cloudy day like this. In the image, the diamond rock looks wonderfully transparent, but glass, as we all know, is reflective. Eventually, the building will look much more like a mirroring lump. No one, except from the employees of a Dutch banking firm, will be able to see the building from this bird's eye perspective. And we also don't see this soft light dropping in Amsterdam every day. And I also doubt if the greenery will look as lush on a winter's day, um, in particular given the building's uh, position close to Amsterdam's ring road. And this rendering, I think, is a symptom. It illustrates how architectural media, um, such as Arts Daily, represent buildings today with unrealistic visuals and um, irrelevant writing. And these media little, do little more than spread this eye candy. Um, and as I will demonstrate today, this has not always been the case. One final illustration of what I think is wrong with renderings today. Um, this is an article seri series we ran on a website called Field Architecture. And we asked people around the world to submit images of the so-called boy in the yellow cap, who resurfaces in dozens of architectural drawings. Uh, renderings, and here we see him walking with his mom um, in a museum, a revamped urban park, and a Zaha Hadid-like uh, megastructure. I will now turn to the historical dimension of my talk. Um, of course, architects and planners have been mediatizing architecture um, ever since the invention of the printing uh, press. And with the advent of modernism in the post-war period, and by the post-war period I mean the 1950s until the 1980s, uh, this mediatization um, gets an extra dimension, I think. So this is a press image um, taken from the company archives of a Dutch property developer. And my question is, what is underpinning this image? Um, as with the renderings we just saw, the complex reality of everyday urban life is transformed into a comprehensible scale model. Uh, the image is carefully styled. We see men, usually architects were men in the 1960s, as is still the case today, um, listening to each other, sleeves rolled up, and we have this godlike perspective standing uh, above um, the city. And underpinning this image is the message that the future of cities was predictable and even feasible in the hands of these men. These are stills from a video produced by the same uh, development company, um, also to bring this image of, of technocracy and uh, creating a better future home. And with the use of the latest technology and by putting to work the brightest minds in architecture and planning, we can design and build the future. So was the message at the time. Now, in many cases, modernist planners, such as the ones behind me, wanted to wipe the slate clean. During the first post-war decades, the 1950s, 1960s, uh, the consensus was that urban functions should be, should be separated and historical buildings were to be replaced by spacious blocks of flats and multi-lane expressways, um, providing residents with a lush and green environment uh, suited for modern living. I've chosen this image um, to demonstrate how the modernists mediatized uh, the historical urban landscape and all its problems, its alleged problems, I should say. So the mixing of urban functions and traffic the needless ornamentation of buildings uh, and noise and air pollution, which was very common at the time in, um, in cities. This is an image from a street scene in Berlin. And of course, in architecture and planning, not only such imagery, but also maps um, were used to get the point across of um, there is something wrong with this environment and we should alter it. And these are how the modernist expressways uh, were visualized in architectural drawings at the time. It is a rather pastoral image, I would say, of the future, with someone writing a pram, um, a person reading a newspaper, 
public artworks underneath a concrete overpass with traffic roaring on top. Now, what should become, should become clear here is that this is a very misleading image, of course, of the near future, very similar to the renderings we just saw, um, as this modernist wonderland, of course, nowhere, comes nowhere near um, reality. A different um, pastoral depiction of urban modernism, the image we just saw was Glasgow, this is Amsterdam, the plan to construct an expressway to replace Amsterdam's Hobbemarkade. If you look closely, you will recognize uh, the Rijksmuseum under number seven. This is an image from 1968. Now, the side effect of this modernist mediatization of the urban future was resistance from both residents and uh, a younger generation of architects. These two images are from the same year, 1965. One is a very utopian mediatization of the area uh, surrounding Leidse Plain and a rather dystopian one. Um, and what we see happening is that from the mid-1960s onwards, the tides begin to change in urban planning and architecture, and there's resistance looming against urban modernism, not only in Amsterdam. Um, and this is one of the most mediatized images uh, in architectural history, uh, the demolition of the prout Igo estate in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, made famous by, uh, amongst others, the experimental film Koyanis Katsi. The image has acquired a highly symbolic meaning. Um, it has become um, the symbol of the end of urban modernism, or as architectural historian Charles Jenks um, famously described this moment in time, modernism died on the 15th of July, 1972 at 3.32 p.m. or thereabouts, end of quote. So only a few years after urban modernism became mainstream, uh, in architecture and planning, it was already beginning to die a slow and painful death. And in the process, mediatization again played a pivotal role, or as my colleague, and this is the only um, citation I will use, but as my colleague Samuel Zip writes about the cultural afterlife of urban redevelopment, urban renewal projects and other like-minded attempts at city remaking on a grand scale are first imagined, designed, planned and built, but then they are represented and used and thus reimagined, and so in a symbolic sense, rebuilt. Most important, the way they are reimagined gives impetus and shape to the future efforts at designing, planning and building so that new cityscapes of facts can emerge from the old. Back to Amsterdam to see what happens um, in response to urban modernism, to redevelopment. Action groups um, that resisted urban redevelopment were highly effective in visualizing the negative side effects of urban redevelopment. We see uh, one poster by an action group located on the Bickers Island, which is to the west of Central Station, and another image of the Jordaan. And what you see depicted here is uh, new builds visualized by residents in collaboration with um, younger architects uh, on the one hand, and then uh, the uh, detrimental effects of urban redevelopment in the Jordaan, colored in red. So these are images drawn by action groups together with architects. So you see this new coalition coming together of, um, well, one could say anti-modernists opposing the ideas behind urban modernism and redevelopment. Another series of images um, against the property dynamics of urban redevelopment. So one is uh, another one from Germany. Um, you might recognize a swastika here. Um, we see Adam and Eve uh, being driven from paradise. Paradise equals um, the historical um, city center, and they're being driven towards um, modernist development such as Balmer. Um, and then uh, finally, we have property developers playing Monopoly with uh, the streets of Amsterdam. So these images, again, are, well, one could say counter images to the ones we just saw drawn by the modernists. And those uh, residents opposing urban redevelopment were also against the political establishment. So this is an image depicting an elected official uh, responsible for the construction of Amsterdam's metro, pictured here as Louis de Great um, and the so-called Metro Red which is a reference to the digging and um, um, demolition um, necessary to build the metro lines at the time. So this is about the Newmarket area, which was uh, earmarked for demolition in the 1950s to make way for office blocks, hotels, and this uh, metro line. So I come to the uh, final part of my uh, presentation, and I will talk about uh, primary sources, which is really, or which are really valuable to historians. Those are the things that make my heart beat faster. Mm. 
and I will talk about um, the media platforms uh, those critical architects and residents uh, used to get their point across. One of the most famous um, uh, media platforms at the time in the 1970s was Wonen TABK. Uh, it's one of my favorite media platforms, critical and engaged reporting on urban affairs, very different from today's architectural media, um, if I may say so. So uh, I think this is a very uh, interesting and wonderful primary source. Um, this is another example, um, a special issue on property development in Amsterdam during the early 1970s. This is not a squatter, but a developer uh, resembling a thief um, and many facts and figures on the other image uh, of the local property market. And these were collected by residents um, and then also printed by uh, residents in this um, special issue. And these media were an important platform for the younger architects um, I mentioned earlier who were mainly aligned with the um, structuralist movement spearheaded by Aldo van Eyck. And this drawing I took from the archive uh, demonstrates how his pupil Theo Bos, you can forget about those names if you're not familiar with the Amsterdam uh, case study, but still involved residents in uh, the design process. So the scribblings refer to comments made by residents of Amsterdam's new marked area and they talk to the architects about how they would like their future uh, living environment to uh, look like. Um, so this is a very uncommon, in our time at least, alliance between architects and uh, residents opposing urban uh, modernism. And such counter-proposals to redevelopment of the area were published in, amongst others, Wonen TBK, um, and also eventually realized. So this is the Pentagon uh, building. Uh, which houses dozens of um, social housing units on a prime uh, location. And this younger and um, um, more critical generation of architects also had a very dry sense of humor. Um, next time you're cycling in the Nieuwe Hoogstraat, if you are an Amsterdam resident, have a look at this facade. Um, translated from Dutch, it basically says that after the struggle over urban redevelopment, Residents and elected officials are smoking a peace pipe again, and this peace pipe is actually built into the facade. Um, so this is a pun on urban redevelopment, the struggle, and what came after. We can also find remnants of the struggle over urban redevelopment inside the metro station, um, which in a way is also the mediatization of architecture, one could say. Now, I would like to finish my presentation uh, with a few examples of what happened to the mediatization of urban modernism, um, particularly by looking at, in particular by looking at um, some um, images from uh, films, popular culture. Um, and in the popular culture of the 1960s and 70s, it became visualized, urban modernism, as a place of alienation and estrangement, which induced all kinds of antisocial and transgressive behavior. The work of Jacques Tati, as you see pictured here, uh, was a rather, I would say, unharmful and friendly depiction of the wrongs of architectural modernism. But Stanley Kubrick's uh, A Clockwork Orange, of course, is a different story. The behavior of the hoodlum protagonists is directly linked to the surroundings they grew up in, um, London's Thamesmead Estates, which in 1973 was um, nearing completion. Also in novels, urban modernism came to play a questionable role uh, one can think of the work of J.G. Ballard here, uh, which in turn influenced the bleak post-industrial repertoire of Joy Division. And this film by Anton Corbijn was shot in one of the few original housing estates still standing in the UK at the time, um, Nottingham's Lenten Flats. I have visited the, the site recently and um, I can tell you that those blocks have been demolished now as well. So to conclude, uh, the mediatization of architecture, um, both in renderings, modernist vistas and popular culture, has heavily influenced, I think, and still influences today, um, our everyday experiences and opinions of the built environment. And I think it is time for architectural media and architects to learn from the recent past and see how they can learn from colleagues who used images and drawings to convince the powers that be uh, on behalf of uh, the people they should be representing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Please join us here. <clears throat> so we have about 20 minutes left for uh, debate and discussion. Let me, let me start off by saying that um, I, I thought it were all three very fascinating presentations. 
but in a certain sense, they stay on the on the side of critical thinking, right? They are almost in relation to what you were saying. They're at a safe distance in a certain sense, and not so much with Pinar, who is with her feet on the ground in the in the Belmar, uh, which is quite a place to be. But you know, this is this is comfortable critical discourse that we know and that we understand. And of course, in, in the collaboration that we have in Arias, there's all, also this fac factor of making things. Right? Artists are makers. So in your vision, in, in, in the terrains that you have been researcher, is there a possibility of injecting alternatives? Not so much solutions. You know, we're not talking about you know changing everything around and making it completely better. But are there? Do you see any options of having in entrances fantasies, alternatives that might change things around? Well, um... can we go back from mediatization? No. So, are there better ways of mediatization? I think. Um... What you see happening with architecture students, at least, is that when they um, see a building that is problematic, um, they want to change it. Yeah. But I don't think architects play that an important role. Um, I think actually that you, the, 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 the people themselves and how they adapt are, is much more interesting and is a much better way of creating a better future. So you do not necessarily have to start doing something, you can also learn from the past and then leave the building as it is. Um, I'm not so sure, I don't know if Pinar agrees, but that um, uh, the surroundings actually influence people's behavior in such a um, large way. Um, I think architects uh, can be a bit more humble in that respect. But in your analysis, a, a lot of the trouble starts before in mm -hmm. the images. And of course, as you've shown us the images get more realistic and more abstract at the same time, mm -hmm. right? There is almost a literal distance because they're produced somewhere else. Is there, is there something else possible in relation to that? Would it be possible to create images also in relation or with the people that are living in a neighborhood? Well, I don't know, Pinar, um, are you drawing images with uh, people? I mean, you can, of course, p ask people, I know colleagues who do this, to draw images of their living surroundings and then ask them uh, if it resembles reality. So I think drawing and let people draw who actually live in an area can be, um, well, something that's worthwhile. You can learn from how people draw uh, certain maps, but I don't know if that's something you practice in, in your work as well. Um, not yet, but now I'm thinking of new <laughs> methodologies, actually, yeah. as we speak. Sounds good. Um, but uh, what I was thinking about also, uh, our role as researchers who are in between this architecture field and, uh, yeah, the daily life, let's say, also how we project the reality, how we look at the reality, that can also change. So that's what I always try to do by giving a different image uh, of what, is, uh, what, what the others are seeing, let's say. And um, there, I think, uh, also us as researchers can play a role, not only architects or uh, the residents. Um, and about, uh, yeah, the role of uh, space and the role of architecture, um, I think uh, this, the physical, um, let's say, space, it, its role is more on creating invitations. It's not to decide how anybody should do or something, but that invitation is quite important, actually, yeah. how you want right. to give form to that. And, um, and there, uh, then, uh, the planners and the architects have to be able to take a step back and respect how um, people, uh, yeah, the residents accept that invitation how, and what they want to do with it. Yeah. Um, and how so does that work out for you in, in Zuidoost? Because you do research, you give it back, right? you get feedback. Yeah. Does the, how does the conversation influence what happens? Uh, conversation is always a very uh, fruitful layer for me, so it's, uh, it changes sometimes uh, how I see uh, the reality, let's say, because what I always say is that I'm only a researcher in the end. Yes, yeah. of course, we have a role, but then I'm only uh, d trying to understand what's happening. Yeah. And I let also myself be become influenced by uh, what uh, the, 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 the city officials say, what the neighborhood uh, professionals say, and what the residents say, let's say. Um, there should also also be a, a space uh, from the researcher's perspective to adapt as an no, architect. Of <laughs> but the other way around, of course, we understand that once you start thinking and talking about something, you realize things. Not only you as a researcher, but also the inhabitants there. Do you see that process happen? That you give you know, your research results to people, they talk, they react to it, they think about it, 
and and something starts happening or not yeah it's uh, something starts happening and that's very beautiful to see uh because um what, what's what's happening a lot is that i'm working in a municipal context so my first contact people are uh, the civil servants also and uh, what is difficult is that there are many pre predefined uh, definitions to social problems and uh, uh, it's yeah it's very frames. That, uh, what's yes exactly like frames. Mm -hmm. yeah they're already uh, pre-made frames and um, it's uh, also very nice that the city officials themselves uh, in, in, um, give me the space to ch not change their minds, of course, but think uh, uh, from a different perspective. So draw a new line uh, to the conclusion. So that's, uh, that was also the case in Trash. Uh, it was actually always framed as a behavioral issue in the neighborhood, as, uh, and uh, many interventions were based on uh, behavioral influence, so Hedraxby including, for example. Yeah. But then uh, this is uh, something different. We're talking about the rhythms of the environment, and there are many ways to actually change it, many ways to recognize yeah. it even. So, yeah. yeah, it was a different perspective like that. Okay, good. Yeah, so your question is also, can we move beyond being a critical spectator? Yeah, but, well, you, you've been working on the Zuidas for yeah. as long as it exists. So I, I think um, I, I, I understand what you what you want to create. Uh, I think the Zuidas is a quite extreme place within Amsterdam. It is because it's uh, so. Therefore, it's fascinating, but yeah. it makes it makes uh, such a position extra difficult. Yes, because this is the place in Amsterdam which is driven by money, uh, by corporate affairs. Uh, by renderings, by yeah. images, and of course you could you could do. I, I like this idea of rhythms and and sort of do more ethnographic research yeah. in the area, be more precise. I mean, my my presentation was a, an overview of decades not being precise. Of course, it can be added with all kinds of additional research. So I agree with South Axis. I think it's very difficult to to break into their discourse. I see in other places in the city. Uh, which I could not present today, that there's much more opportunity. Yeah. Particularly in, in disadvantaged neighborhoods, for example, uh, our university is, is closely connected to all kinds of initiatives. And we meet many other uh, research institutes there as well. Yeah. Because there the, the, the field is in a way much more open. Uh, and there is no predefined solution. There is a, a combination of, of social, economic, safety problems. There are a lot of professionals that don't know how to act. So in, in, then they... The then intervention they, makes sense or has a chance, you say? Yeah, then, then they... Uh, at, at South Axis, I, I always feel that I'm the sort of the unwanted visitor that yeah. wants to spoil their party or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, and the this corporate is, uh, culture, you're, you're, you're not going yeah, along Yeah, you first have to dress culture. a bit like that you fit in. Yeah. Um, you first have to be their friends to understand them, and then it becomes more hard to criticize them. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, recently I think there was yet another frame for the Zuidas which should become a city, new city center mm -hmm. to you know, get rid of the, or to diminish the tourist overload of the old center. Does that have any chance in your eyes? Well, I think we, we, time is an important thing. So I'm, I'm a bit skeptical to say a harsh yes or no. Um, I think tourism is, of course, a, a big issue in this city. Um, what you see at South Texas, at least there have been building hotels. So at least it's now a location where tourists are sleeping. Yeah. They actually have no clue that it's South Texas or no. whatever, but... Uh, mm. This whole idea of sort of uh, trying to spread tourists over the city, um, I'm a bit skeptical about that. Yes. Yeah, because you know, I mean, yeah. there, maybe some architecture uh, interested tourists, <laughs> they're yeah. maybe easier to sort of. Uh, but there's not enough to be there, right? There's, no. there's not. No, there's, there's hotels. And As you know, that from the Rietve, we were also involved, of course, with notions of art and public space in the Zuidas, and that was mm -hmm. al almost impossible, also. Very difficult. And, and from the beginning, I've been pleading for something like de-gentrification. So where gentrification is going on, why not go for de-gentrification? And maybe time will work that way. If the mm -hmm. McDonald's gets there, then you will get a certain element of de-gentrification. De yeah. yeah, well, trash is actually a very a big issue with yeah. McDonald's because that's where of course. <laughs> residents yeah. are, are afraid that there will suddenly be trash on the south axis. Yeah. Yeah. Zuidas needs more trash then. It, it yeah. needs more trash. A bit more, maybe. maybe. Yeah. Trashy people, more trashy people. <laughs> now, 
Tim, now we, we hear from Stan and you see from Pinar that, that research in a certain sense is taking a different position, right? It's no longer distance, it's re inter trying to intervene and not just as a social worker, but really in taking care of the complexity of a neighborhood. At the same time, in the building process, this influence of uh, inhabitants seems to have been diminished. Can you say something about that? Well, first off, to come back to your first question about uh, what we do as activist scholars, I think what we are doing as historians is empowering people by giving them the tools to talk about the history of their right. surroundings and then yeah. maybe also organize um, if uh, there's a force threatening them. So I think that's something we can mm -hmm. do as historians, talk about the history of a place. Mm -hmm. But I think in the design process nowadays, um, I mean, the, the, the urban renewal policies, both the, um, let's say, uh, grant redevelopment schemes of the 1960s and 70s and the more cautious schemes of the 1980s and 1990s were heavily state supported. So you yeah. see the welfare state supporting its own opposition by funding those action groups. And they're also taking mm. a lead role in uh, building social housing, obviously. And that's different than our time. It's still possible. Um, I have to think of the work of Peter Barber in London, um, who is actually designing social housing units very uh, much in line with the ideas of the structuralists, so creating meeting places and um, collective spaces where people can gather. Um, and also in Amsterdam, there's the Rue Paré community. It's this former school building where people are um, coming together from the neighborhoods. But um, I must say that in our time, it, it is, has become increasingly difficult to, to organize um, as, as residents, um, um, activists. And it also has to do with people um, moving more frequently. So I think those social bonds are not as strong as in the 1970s and 80s. And also, I think to be critical, you need time. And in our time, um, time is money, if you get what I'm saying. So um, back then, you had this younger generation that could study for <laughs> 10 years without uh, paying um, tuition fees or not so much tuition fees as today. And I think we have lost that, that, that critical uh, generation nowadays. It's mainly, um, well, um, all the people uh, that have the means to be um, 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 the well, baby critical, the baby boomers. Uh, and these people are mainly talking about NIMBY um, problems, things that should not happen in their backyard instead of, well, the more social yeah. activism we see in the 1970s and 80s. I know nostalgia is not a good... Um, thing for historians, no. but still. Um. Yeah. No, but it's clear to me that within Amsterdam at least, but also in other cities, I think, there's on the one end this discourse of democratization. Yes. And we have a current government that, that has a whole toolkit of ideas how to improve democratization, particularly on the, on the, on the neighborhood level. Yeah. Um, but it seems to, to be a bit superficial in a way. Uh, yeah, it's streamlining. I mean, they call. I, often you see it being called participation, but the decisions have already been made. So yeah. it's it's participation afterwards. You and can choose between A and B. You know, yeah, that's and, it. In, and in my neighborhood where I live, it's just an ordinary neighborhood in Amsterdam. I can participate in the neighborhood budget system, so I can decide together with all my 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 neighbors about uh, small amenities. Exactly. Yeah. But the bigger issue of, yeah. of gentrification or whatever, th this is not part of, of, of that process. No. So it's a bit sort of a, a playground of democratization, yeah. uh, which is sort of, if you are skeptical, sort of bypassing uh, the real problem. Yeah, and they call it ownership, right? to give ownership to the inhabitants, yeah. which is ownership of the color of the, you know, <laughs> the plant in the front garden. Yeah. Yeah. How do you see this, this whole process, this development, Pina? Because you're also a little bit in a double position, right? I mean, you are a researcher, you are interested in social processes, but you become part of those processes, not as an inhabitant there, but as an external factor that may cause things that you don't, you're not aware of. How do you see that? Um, well, what I uh, aim to do a lot is to give a new vocabulary to talk about yeah, uh, things. Yeah, same as Tim. In yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, rhythm is a nice vocabulary. So, And uh, it's also nice to see how uh, residents and also uh, civil servants, many p different people, react to it. So the rhythm becomes uh, part of the vocabulary instead of saying, yeah, these people did that and these people did that. And that vocabulary could also create more engagements between uh, different people. So Because sometimes maybe the reason for participation is uh, yeah, not being able to connect with the other or not knowing uh, the other. 
And uh, yeah, maybe having new vocabularies <laughs> could, yeah. uh, could help there. No, but it's a good point, of course. Yeah. And then if, if the rhythm becomes the vocabulary, is it, uh, you've, you've shown us that the rhythms are influenced by many different factors, right? Yeah. It's not a simple thing. It's not just the architecture. Is it possible to influence them by, by taking measure? Is it, is it possible to change the rhythm? And do you want to change the rhythm? Or should it change from itself? Yeah, that's a question for not me to decide, I think. Why not? <laughs> well, um... you, you will be an urban planner before you know it, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it is possible to change the rhythms, but how uh, you want to change this is very crucial. Yeah. So, uh, like in my analysis, you can decide to put a gathering rhythm zone where there is not so much activity, but that yeah. means uh, to change, uh, to make physical changes and social changes. Or you can also decide not to change the rhythms, but adapt uh, the infrastructures to those rhythms to make yeah. them more flexible. Yeah. Again, I'm talking about in case of uh, trash, which mm -hmm. could respond better to the rhythm. So yeah. I think the cho uh, choice is whether you want to change the rhythms or do you want to respond better to them. Mm -hmm. And there, the key, again, is first of all to understand them, where it's coming yeah. from and what they are, actually. Sure. Thank you very much. I think we're almost at the end. Oh, really? <laughs> is there anyone who wants to make a final comment? Well, I, I, f I find it interesting because it's in a way uh, social engineering, in a way. Yeah, um, which is I don't like that word. No, no, no. I don't want to accuse you from something, but it's it's of course planning has to do and architecture has to, has to do a lot with social engineering and and in the case of of, of your your in your case study, I think it should be interesting to do this social engineering. Maybe not use that word, but together with the residents. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. To take it up as, a, as an aspect anyway, because it's there, it is there. Yeah. Even mm -hmm. if you call it rhythm, it is there. The social engineering is yes. there? No, well, it is, <laughs> no, it is a possibility. It is in the background. Of course, yeah, yeah it it's is a there. Yeah. yeah. But you cannot avoid it. But to stick to the rhythm, that's also a choice and yeah. a decision. No, I understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you all very much. This was about uh, the double life of architecture. Actually, I think the many lives of architecture, as we heard it. Thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you also for the discussion. I found it very interesting. Yes, thank you for moderating. Thank you. <laughs>